Good afternoon and welcome to Macaulay Arnott's College. On behalf of the Dean, Dean Mary Pearl, um, we would like to welcome you to the first, the second Macaulay Honors um, author series. My name is Charmaine Ludlow and I work in the external relations office at Macaulay. Tonight we have a special treat for you. We are celebrating women in the sciences and tonight we will be featuring Dr. Yasmin Daniels, our class of Macaulay class of 2008 and Ashley Steely class of 2000. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on both of our students and for Dr. Yasmin Daniels, she's a science policy researcher. Dr. Daniels has a PhD in analytical chemistry and has a has done a great deal of research I'm sorry, and has done a great deal of research in environmental remediation, which is a fancy way of saying finding ways to make the environment cleaner. She has worked on projects where the design, where she designed eco-friendly particles that were capable of removing toxic substances like heavy metals from water. She also spent some time improving analytical methods used for analyzing nanoparticles and inorganic polymers. Currently, Dr. Daniels works in an industrial hygienist in government and spends a lot of her time reviewing and assessing industrial and airborne particles hazards. And her work for, focuses primarily on ways workers can protect themselves from such hazards while at work, and especially wearing respirators. And the bulk of her time is spent researching, reading, writing, and interpreting the science behind workplace hazards and methods of protection. When she isn't doing her full-time job, Dr. Daniels is a full-time mom, a chemistry adjunct professor, volleyball coach, mentor, and champion of STEAM and art, which we call STEAM outreach. Dr. Daniels obtained her bachelor's of science in chemistry from Hunter College and her MPhil and PhD from the CUNY University of New York. As a chemistry student, she was inspired and encouraged by her chemistry professors, and she has been dedicated ever since to give back to her students and academia. She teaches both general chemistry and, and organic chemistry and enjoys sharing her passion for science with, uh, with her students. Welcome to Dr. Daniels. With us also is Ashley Steely. Ashley is a recent graduate from Macaulay at Hunter but she majored in human biology and double majored in public health and health in public policy. While at Macaulay, she served as co-president of the Macaulay Diversity Initiative Club. And currently Ashley is pursuing her master's degree in health administration at Columbia University at Mailman School of Public Health. Welcome to both of them. Well, um Thank you, Ski. Oh, sorry, didn't realize I could, my mic was on. But thank you, Charmaine, for the warm welcome. And we're really looking forward to talking with you all today. And I'll just jump right into the first question for Dr. Daniels, which is, can you go into more detail on your academic and professional journey from college up until now? Sure. And thank you, Charmaine. Thank you, Ashley. Um, and thank you to Macaulay um, Honors College for allowing me this opportunity to share my experience and to talk a little bit about my book. So I, um, as Charmaine mentioned, I attended Hunter College. Um, while I was at Hunter College, I obviously was a part of the Macaulay Honors College. Um, and from there, I ended up um, remaining within the City University of New York. So I stayed within CUNY to pursue my, um, my, my PhD in chemistry. Um, I decided to stay um, because the research that I was doing as an undergraduate student um, in a chemistry lab, I really fell in love with the research and I loved it. Um, I loved everything about it. I enjoyed um, the lab that I was working in and I had an amazing mentor who I'll probably talk about a little bit later. Um, and so working in that lab, it made me realize that I actually did have a passion for to pursue science and for chemistry. And I wanted to continue working on the project that I was already working on. So I decided to stay and remain within CUNY um, and I began the PhD program, you know, in the fall after I graduated um, as an undergraduate. Um, and from there, I decided to go on to do uh, to doing a postdoc um, at a, a government lab. So at a federal lab, I, um, I went to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, and I received the fellowship to do um, my postdoctoral research there working on nanoparticles, as Charmaine mentioned. Um, and so I worked there for, for some time. Um, and as is typical of um, 
folks who have graduated from a PhD program, a research program, you do a lot of lab and, and sort of bench work and you try to generate lots of data so that you can publish. And so at that point I realized I liked it, but I wasn't really um, seeing the impact of my research. I guess I wanted some sort of uh, more of instant gratification just to you know, understand where my research was going and who it was actually impacting. So I missed that. I, I missed um, interacting with people. Um, I did really like science and doing the research part, but I wanted a slight change. And so I ventured into, um, something slightly different. And I went and I took on a position to be a federal investigator. So essentially I would um, go out on inspections um, and still utilizing the, the, the science um, techniques that I had learned. So I was an analytical chemist and I used a lot of analytical instruments to, make, uh, to take measurements. So as a federal investigator, I was no longer working in the lab, you know, doing science experiments, but I was out in the field with similar tools, so analytical tools, um, taking measurements in the field. So I was actually taking measurements of um, things such as the workplace um, air samples. Um, and then I would take those back to my office and ship them off to a federal lab to have them analyzed. And then use, the, use that information to understand how um, folks in the workplace may or may not have been exposed to workplace um, hazards such as chemical hazards. So I, I did that for some time and it really allowed me to connect with people um, to help, it, it helped me to explain to them the science behind things um, in their everyday environment, which was their work environments, which I thoroughly enjoyed because I really am passionate about communicating science to, to people, um, especially to people who wouldn't necessarily um, understand the science behind these everyday things and chemicals that they were working with. And, um, I've been here ever since. So I've recently moved from being in the field as a federal investigator over to the side of policy. So now I work more on researching, writing, interpreting the regulations behind workplace safety and health hazards. Um, so now that you know a little bit about me, um, I understand you're also in the sciences, um, Ashley. So would you mind sharing a little bit of your experience from college to now with us? Yeah, sure. So um, I graduated from Hunter, same as you, but last spring with a degree in human biology, which is more social science than life science. And I also double minored in public health and public policy. Currently, I'm studying at the Millman School of Public Health at Columbia University, where I'm getting my master's in health administration under the Department of Health Policy and Management. So right now, I consider myself to be a part of like two fields, so specifically healthcare management field and the public health field. That being said, I started out college as a pre-med, honestly, just because that's what everyone else was doing at Hunter and I really had no idea what I was really interested in. But now that I'm thinking about it, I was really forcing myself just to be pre-med because I didn't really have an understanding of like the variety of other jobs that were available in the STEAM field. But um, on a different note, I started, um, I was during organic chemistry lecture my sophomore year that I decided that pre-med was not for me because I was not having a fun time and I did not envision myself having a fun time in the future. So by my junior year, I had declared a major in human biology because I really wanted an interdisciplinary, excuse me, education. And I was able to take courses in sociology and psychology and anthropology and public health. And that's really how I got introduced to public health in the first place. So I took my first public health class just to knock an elective out of the way, but I ended up loving it so much that I to declare it as my minor the very next semester. And I just found it enlightening just to learn about the social determinants of health and health disparities. And I made these two specific areas the topics of my human biology thesis, my public health thesis, and my public policy thesis. So, um, but now I'm in health administration. So while I'm interested in public health and health policy, I'm also interested in the business side of healthcare. I've always been good at math and I've always been good with numbers. So I thought it would be cool to just like merge my public health skills and my, my public health interests, excuse me, and my number skills together. So since Macaulay covered the cost of my education, I just decided to take an accounting class and an economics class just to see if you know this was a great fit for me. And then I did a summer internship at Mount Sinai's corporate office just right before my senior year. And that's how I got introduced into hospital operations. And right after that internship, I just decided to apply to grad school. And now here I'm at, I am about to finish my first year. That's so, wonderful. oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say, so like now that we're basically done talking about our 
journeys, we can go a little more into like who has been our major influences um, or even great mentors to us in college and over the years in general. Um, that's a good question. So I think I've had several mentors over the years. Um, there, there are a few who I sort of still hang on to. Um, and so one of whom is my college um, chemistry professor who also turned out to be my graduate um, dissertation advisor. And he is still currently at Hunter College, Dr. Spiro Alexandrados. Um, I believe he, he may also still be uh, teaching courses for Macaulay Honors um, College. Um, he's an amazing professor and he's extremely passionate about chemistry. If you sit and speak with him, he will convince you that you probably should be a chemist also. Um, and his passion for chemistry, I think it's infectious. And that's really, um, I think one of the main persons who I attribute my, my passion for chemistry to. And um, I really just thoroughly enjoyed going to his office and talking about um, like a difficult chemistry concept that I was struggling with. And he would honestly calm me down and say, well, Yasmin, it's just so simple. All you have to do is think about it this way and that way. And there you have it. And I, I kid you not, every time I left his office, I, I, I kept thinking, this is so simple. How could I not have thought about it this way? Um, and so he was truly an inspiration to me. Um, I still use a lot of the things that I learned from him um, today and just in my you know normal, um, in, in my career, but also in, in the courses that I teach. So I actually, in addition to being a policy scientist, I also am an adjunct chemistry professor. So I went into teaching chemistry that I loved it that much. Um, and so in teaching some of my own students, I utilize some of the things that I did learn from Dr. Alessandrados um, in my teaching style and my teaching methods. Um, I also have other mentors outside of academia, you know, folks who I rely on, who I met um, along my journey, along my career, um, one of whom is also an author. So she is um, Janice Thomas. And so she has really been instrumental in helping to um, you know, nurture my passions, my passion to, you know, write a book, to be a STEM professional, to be a, a leading woman in STEM, to be a Black woman in STEM. Um, she reinforces a lot of, you know, my truths and she encourages me. So I think it's really important to have those types of people in your corner because it's not an easy journey, but when you have folks like that who um, continue to usher you along, um, you inevitably succeed. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to have that. Um, what about you? Any, any, anyone that you would like to sort of highlight for um, influencing you or helping you along your journey? Yeah, um, the first person who comes to mind is my one of my public health professors at Hunter, so Dr. Susan Cardenas. She, I took like three public health classes with her over the course of like two years, and I just really enjoyed learning with her. And I also appreciated that she really supported my projects that touched upon racial health disparities in New York City. And she also wrote one of my letters, a recommendation for graduate school. So she really helped me to get where I am now. And another person I'm thinking of is Dr. Shiyama. She's in the public policy department at Hunter. And basically, I only had her for one semester during my absolute last semester. But her public policy class was very challenging. But I really appreciated it because it really influenced me to think critically and just influenced me to consider the stakeholders whenever I'm developing policies and strategies in general. So like even now in graduate school, when I'm like, working on projects, I'm always thinking in her voice, who are the stakeholders? Like, how do I appeal to them? How do I influence them? How do I, um, you know, want, how do I make them join my corner? So um, one last person would have to be my Macaulay advisor, Vasily. He really offered like a lot, a lot of support to me during my years of undergrad. He never looked at me sideways when I changed my major like four times. He always encouraged my academic interests. He always made sure I was on track to graduate. And he always looked at my essays for graduate schools or for scholarships or for whatever internship I was applying to. And each of these people really helped me to become the first woman in my family to graduate with a bachelor's degree and the first person in my family to attend graduate school. Wow, that's impressive. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no problem. Um, so that was a nice ending, I feel like, for the introductions topic. So now we'll move on to the next topic, which is um, basically talking a little more about being a Black woman in STEM. So since, you know, it's Women's History Month, it's only right that we talk a little bit about being a woman in STEM. And since Black History Month just ended a couple of days ago, we'll also talk about, you know, the answer, um, 
the intersectionality, excuse me, of being a Black woman in STEM. So my next question for you is, can you describe any struggles and opportunities that you have encountered as a woman and as a Black person in the STEM field? Yeah, um, where should I start? <laughs> um, I think uh, just for starters, I guess, growing up, and there are probably a lot of Black women who feel the same way as I do, especially Black women in STEM, but going through, um, going through the process, you don't typically see a lot of people who look like you, especially back then. I think it's probably, um, it's more, I guess, prevalent now, but going through the process myself, I did not see many who looked like me. And I think part of my support came from me outwardly seek seeking that um, type of representation. So um, I reached out to groups that I knew um, that provided support to women and you know to minority students. Um, of course, Macaulay was a great support system. As you mentioned, they provided not only financial support, but all kinds of opportunities. They, they gave us a cultural passport. Um, and I mean, I can go on and on about Macaulay. Macaulay was amazing. Um, but I think that support, um, especially because um, the academic process, I think is what is um, primarily responsible for shaping us as, um, as professionals. And going through that process, if we don't have adequate resources and all of the support that we, can, we, we need, um, it probably might set us off our courses. So I think, um, going back to your question, being, being Black in the sciences, um, one of the groups that I did reach out to was the MBRS MARC program that Hunter has. And that program is, I believe it's an NIH funded program that allows minority students to focus on the science um, without necessarily having to worry about other things that minorities, other challenges that minority students face, be it, you know, financial issues or just other, you know, socioeconomic issues that we um, typically tend to experience. And um, it allowed, it, it, it supports a student in, in pursuing research, so working in an actual lab um, at the college, um, and it provides additional financial support. So it was great to have that program on board. They brought in lots of different speakers, and I think it was through that program that I actually got to see more minority scientists, um, because they brought in speakers who looked like me, and outside of that, I never, ha I never had that experience or opportunity. Um, so again, you know, being Black in, in the sciences, um, having support like that is, is, is amazing. Um, so being black in the sciences, we, all, we already said, um, you know, we are, we do, we are underrepresented. Um, and so when you compound that with being a woman in the sciences, you can already imagine how um, much fewer of us there are. So I think it's, you know, it's extremely important to really actively seek out uh, some type of support. And I think that can be in the form of a mentor or just a group or an association, a society that act actually provides resources to help fuel your drive and to enable you to accomplish the things that you set out to do. Um, and so that, that has been my experience thus far. In my career, um, I've continued to do the same thing. So I've actively reached out to um, you know, folks that I know who are like me or groups that have been um, actively um, supporting um, folks like me, women in the sciences, or Black people in the sciences, or Black women in the sciences, if you combine the two. Um, and I think that has also helped me to, um, you know, allow doors to open up for me, which otherwise probably I would not have access to. Um, so I imagine your experience was probably similar, but I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear a little bit about it. Yeah, my experience was very similar to yours, even though like I'm in the public health field, but I'll talk more about public health in general, since that's where I'm at. So I've been in the field for about three years, I'd say for now. And I've noticed that specifically, there's a lot of research, there is research on racial health disparities, but it hasn't really been publicized to the point where, you know, people are like, there's, there's something that needs to be done. And in fact, I didn't really hear about black health issues being publicly, publicly discussed until this pandemic, when data showed that black people were dying from COVID at this disproportionate rates. And that has really been a struggle for me just because it made me feel like society didn't really value the health and wellness of black people or didn't even value my health and wellness. So with that in mind, I see this oversight like as an opportunity for me, just like as a public health professional to bring attention to the health issues that disproportionately affect black Americans. So throughout undergrad, I just made sure to complete research projects that have brought attention to these disparities, like for example, severe maternal morbidity, life expectancy and premature 
short-term mortality, um, disproportionate access to Medicaid, avoidable disproportion, um, disparities in avoidable diabetes hospitalizations, and much more. And now in graduate school, I'm, I'm learning to strategically plan and to distribute resources effectively, like distribute health resources effectively. So in the future, I plan to, you know, apply that research knowledge and that strategy knowledge and bring it together in order to address some of those disparities in New York City. And on a slightly different note, another opportunity that I found as a Black woman are pipeline programs, kind of like, like you talked about with the research. Um, even though women um, dominate the healthcare industry, less than 20% of them are in leadership positions and racial, racial minorities account for way less of the um, leadership positions, about 15% if I'm remembering correctly. So one program that really got my foot in the door was the Summer Enrichment Program by the Greater New York Hospital Association. It was a pipeline program for underrepresented groups in healthcare management. And it really helped me to, you know, um, it really, at first it was the program that got me the internship with Mount Sinai's corporate office. And secondly, and it introduced me to black healthcare leaders who have been in the game for years. So it connected me to those leaders. I am still talk to some of them today and they're really helping me out through my graduate school career. And it also gave me the confidence just to apply to graduate school and to succeed in healthcare management. So I really do um, recommend, you know, looking for those pipeline programs, you know, places that give you the space to succeed and give you the resources to succeed. And yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think I, I think we're on the same page when it comes to having that support. Definitely. And while we're talking also about our struggles and our opportunities, I feel like another thing that comes up very often now is imposter syndrome. Like a lot of people talk about it. Um, it really hasn't been talked about a lot in the past, but now it's coming out now. So have you ever really experienced imposter syndrome and what practices do you do to overcome it? And also on a different note, on a slightly different note, where do you find the motivation to continue? Um, yeah, I think the imposter syndrome topic is um, something that is, is very alive and well. And um, I think imposter syndrome can be projected both sort of internally and externally. And what I mean by that is obviously internally, it's sort of um, self-explanatory where, you know, you may feel like you're, um, even though after having succeeded and accomplished everything that you've done, you still feel like you're, you're probably not worthy or you don't belong in a particular area. Um, but also I think when I, when I say externally, I think that sometimes, um, we don't get the acknowledgement that we deserve after, even after having accomplished those things. Um, and that sort of fuels that imposter syndrome that we have. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't help the situation at all. Um, and I think, you know, so to sort of segue into what I do to cope with that or what motivates me to keep going, even after having those feelings is, um, I, I like to look at the bigger picture and keep my eye on the prize. So, um, you know, if my goal, for example, in writing my book, which is obviously, you know, going to be the discussion later, um, I, I, I had lots of doubts in writing that book. And I didn't always know that I was going to um, be an author, let alone a best-selling author, um, you know, of a children's book. I didn't really know how I would get it, get it into the hands of children and parents and all of that stuff. There were so many things going through my mind, but I knew the bigger picture was I wanted to communicate, I wanted to connect, and I wanted to share my story. And I was going to work as hard as I could to have that, um, that goal accomplished, um, regardless of what feelings I was having or what feelings that were being imposed on me by others and or opinions. Um, so I think it's sort of like a combination of keeping your eye on the prize, but also putting on your blinders sometimes because um, sometimes um, we, we are our biggest obstacles. And, you know, that's kind of what the imposter syndrome is. It's in spite of all of the accomplishments that you've had, um, you, there's something in your mind, you know, sort of trying to convince you that you still are not worthy and you still don't belong or you still don't deserve, you know, the credit for all that you've put in. So if you can find a way to sort of ignore that, <laughs> um, it does, it does help you to stay on track and to remain motivated and to feel like, you know, you want to keep going. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, I think, um, just the, the idea that doing what I do, I can actually be helping other people. I think that's what also keeps me motivated. Um, you know, even though 
I, I don't always know exactly who I'm going to be connecting with or reaching um, in, in doing what I do. And when I say doing what I do, I mean, obviously, science communication or ed in educating um, in writing a book. I don't necessarily know um, the 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 end goal. I don't know who's going to have the book in their hands, who's going to be sitting and listening to me speak. But if I um, if I'm capable of inspiring just one person in a group, um, I feel like you know that's more than half of my work being done, and that motivates me. Um, what about you? I know imposter syndrome is is infectious, so you probably have some of it too. And do you mind sharing um, maybe a few tips for how you overcome that and what keeps you motivated? Yeah, um, definitely. The first time I experienced imposter syndrome was probably back in high school. I didn't know what it was back then, but you know, now just reflecting back on it, I definitely didn't experience imposter syndrome back then. Um, it was an insanely competitive high school, and I was just constantly comparing myself to other people, and you know, my accomplishments, their accomplishments, like like the, do minds match up? And then in college, when I was trying to be pre med, my imposter syndrome was just an overdrive because. I felt like I was a fraud for not doing as well as my peers. And then it didn't help when like, you know, sometimes I would hear people say, oh, like you only accomplished this just because, you know, of affirmative action or things just like that. Um, but I feel it way less now in graduate school just because like over the years I've learned how to manage it. I feel like, like if I ever feel like I don't belong, I just like tell myself that I'm qualified to be here. I have the ability to make meaningful contributions in this space as uh, someone values my voice, someone, definitely values my voice in the space and I've earned the right to sit in this room. And as for how I find the motivation to continue, I just like to acknowledge the accomplishments that I make no matter how small that they are. Specifically, I just like to reflect back and just like think to myself like, hey, I wouldn't have been able to do this like a year ago. And it just helps me to recognize like any like small progress in my pro in my professional and my personal growth that I wouldn't have noticed before. Because I find that if I only acknowledge like the big accomplishments, it's very easy to feel like I'm not moving forward at all. When there's like an accomplishment drought per se, like if I feel like I haven't done anything big in a while, but just like recognizing those small accomplishments just keeps me motivated. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Recognizing the small accomplishments is definitely, it's big. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, cool. So um, we're just going to move on to now the book portion of the discussion. So Dr. Daniels is going to talk a little bit more about her book, Building My Self-Esteem in Science. And basically, my first question is, was it always your plan to publish a book? And what was your inspiration behind writing your book? Yeah, so um, I, I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but I can go into a little more detail. So the uh, short answer is no, it was not always my plan. Um, I didn't really know that um, I wanted to actually write a book. I always did know that I wanted to um, educate and, um, and mentor. So those were kind of the two pillars. Um, I like um, communicating science or teaching science. Um, and that kind of stemmed from, again, my experience as a student having um, had such a good mentor and a professor who sort of showed me the ropes and allowed me to understand that chemistry wasn't something that, um, you know, students or black students or female students are not to pursue, but it was something that could be loved by just about anybody. Um, and so that that passion or that feeling of, of wanting to continue to pursue chemistry, I felt like I needed to give that back to students coming after me. And one of the ways that I would be able to do that is if I myself became a professor or I continue to um, to teach chemistry or science. Um, so that passion to teach science has sort of been, been there. And so going throughout my career, I'd always been um, invited to participate in um, a series of different types of panels for particularly geared at um, uh, speaking to young girls. And so sharing my experience with them and obviously me growing up as a young girl, there are lots of different um, fears, obstacles, and challenges that I did face. So I understand what it's like being a young girl, um, not just in the sciences, but just being a young girl going through life. So I, um, I particularly took an interest in participating in those, in those types of um, uh, events and panels. And so I grew to actually liking that because I noticed the impact. And even in just speaking to some of the girls at these events and these functions, um, I, I sort of latched onto a few of them and took them under my wing as my mentees. And so I eventually end up sort of 
creating um, my own program. So I have a virtual um, mentoring program for young black girls that I created um, late last year, which really um, was the product of me realizing that there were so many young black girls within my own immediate circle who were adversely impacted by um, not just the lack of social, um, lack of physical interaction, which the pandemic caused, but also because of all of the, um, the graphic images and videos and things that they saw sort of um, flooding the, the airways. So the media and the internet for you know, African-Americans um, who are you know, being killed. So those types of um, images, they, they did something to, something, to, something to Black to Black people who were near and dear to my heart. They weren't really receiving that information um, well, and they were, um, you know, seeking out other types of, of ways to cope. So like going onto social media, maybe following the, the wrong crowds, going into groups, just not really having too much guidance. Um, and so I thought that it was important to continue to nurture them and keep them on the right path, create a space, um, even though it was virtual, a space where they can all see each other um, and still have some form of sisterhood and communication. Um, so that passion to, to mentor girls, um, and the passion to teach science kind of came together and um, allowed me to really produce um, something more tangible, which is the book. And so the book really um, combines those two passions that I have, both to teach and communicate science and to encourage and support youth. Um, and so the book, um, it's called Bu Building My Self-Esteem. And so esteem is sort of a play on the word esteem with a double E, but I use the, the acronym S-T-E-A-M, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Mathematics. So it's essentially building one's confidence in those particular STEAM-related topics. And it's a story that just kind of shares uh, the journey of uh, high school students. Um, who experienced um, different types of challenges in pursuing these subject areas while in school. And it shows how they overcome these challenges, which is very analogous to even an adult going through this in their career. So I think it's a book that can resonate with both youth, but also with adults who may be experiencing similar challenges. Perfect. I love that description. I love that description. And I, sorry, I just heard the feedback. Um, it, basically answering my next question, which is basically about the target audience. So we'll move on to the following question, which is basically about your favorite passage. I read the book myself because Charmaine sent it to me and I really loved it. I really related to it. And I specifically loved the section at the end where you where you just basically listed out different um, fields that were in the STEAM um, field, which I would have appreciated a couple of years ago when I was kind of trying to find my way through that. But um, I wanted to know what was your favorite passage in the book and why is it most meaningful to you? Um, yeah, so before I even get to my favorite passage in the book, um, I kind of just wanted to piggyback off of the last topic a little bit, which will segue into what my favorite passage is. But um, the, the, the book also, in addition to it being a book created to inspire and motivate um, youth to pursue science, but and also to encourage youth to pursue their uh, passions in general, I think um, the book also is a symbol um, and a representation that um, young Black children can be depicted in science books. And so that's something that I also wanted to highlight because that was very important for me, again, growing up, not seeing many um, people who look like me in the sciences, um, you know, young Black girls and, and things of that nature. So my idea was that when a young uh, child like myself growing up, a young Black uh, child picks up a science book and sees a character on that book that looks like them, they'll be even more encouraged to want to, uh, not, not just to pursue it, but to even read the book. So it's also advocating for literacy. Um, so that was really kind of one of the things that encouraged me to do that. Um, and so much so that even now that the book has, um, it's been on the, on the market for you know quite a few months now, um, the feedback that's been coming in from folks who've had a chance to read the book has been um, overwhelming and it's been amazing. And it kind of solidifies my my um my thought my thought process in really you know putting together such a book um, I actually wanted to just read very quickly one of the recent messages that I got because it really warmed my heart and this message was actually um not from a child again it's a children's book but there are numerous amounts of adults reading this book and providing um 
uh, great feedback to me. And that actually is something that I wasn't even expecting in writing the book. But there was a, a student in particular who, um, who is, I believe, a senior in high school. Um, and so she read the book and she sent me a direct message recently um, expressing her, her gratitude for, for, you know, being able to connect with a book and being able, able to connect with me. And I wanted to share that because I thought it was really important to be able to, um, to get that kind of feedback because it, it fuels it fuels me, it helps me to keep going. Um, and it allows me to see that the book is doing exactly what I set out for it to do. So I, um, I'm gonna pull up that message and it's a very short message, but her message to me was, um, the first time I ever met a black woman who is a chemist and or professor was this year. All throughout undergrad, I wondered what it would be like being mentored by someone who's just like me and has experienced the same challenges that I will. So now seeing someone else in real time doing what I dream of is so inspiring. As I start grad school in a few months, it's their success that gives me the confidence that I'll make it to the finish line too. Super grateful for the work that Classy Chemist, and that's me, that's my social media name, um, that Classy Chemist and others are doing. You're paving the way for more of us. And that really warmed my heart to get a message like that, again, from um, a college student who read the book and felt inspired. So it really just speaks to exactly what I wanted the book to do. And I was very thankful for that. But um, that kind of goes into, you asked me about my favorite passage in the book. So there's, um, a passage in the book that I like to share, which is basically an intimate moment that two of the characters share. Um, and as I mentioned before, the book really takes us on a journey of um, characters who are struggling with different aspects of STEAM and particularly science, because this book is building my self-esteem in science. So the, the character is struggling with science and she's sharing that intimate moment with one of her friends. And we get to learn how she, um, she gets a little bit of a nudge and it's just that small nudge that gives her the boost that she needs. And that's really similar to, I think, you know, what we experience in our everyday lives where we feel the imposter syndrome or we feel a little bit unmotivated or we feel, you know, all these kinds of feelings of doubt and, um, Maybe it's, it's us reaching out to a support group or us having a family member or us having um, someone we look to on social media or an author um, who gives us that, that extra boost or that nudge. So um, if you don't mind, I can share that passage with you. Um, I'll pull it up really quickly. <clears throat> So the characters' names are Charisma and Shawnees. And so it starts, so Charisma, how do you feel about your new classes overall? Do you like being in a more advanced class? Well, it's nice being able to tell people that I'm in, honors pro in an honors program, but to be honest, I'm a little worried about the amount of work I'll have to do to keep up. It feels like I'll need to be in high school forever, and we both know my mom wants me to be done with high school like yesterday. Charisma took a sip of her coffee. Maybe if I go back to my old classes, which were easier, I'll feel less pressure and won't have to worry about all of that. Uh, if going to medical school is your goal, the STEAM program is definitely going to be better for you. I think you'll be just fine if you stick with it. Remember, being intimidated by something that seems hard isn't a reason to quit. My grandma, my grandma Ruby always used to say, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. I can definitely help you study for as long as you need me to, and together we're going to be science superstars. So that's my favorite part of the book um, because I, I truly live by that that um, that phrase that if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And sometimes we go through life feeling like something is so difficult, um, not knowing how we would we can ever overcome you know that difficult or that uh, process or that obstacle. And then if you really sit and think to yourself, well not everyone's doing this. And if it were so easy, then everyone would be accomplishing it. Uh, maybe I just need to give myself a little push and I'll get to the other side. Then that really changes your perspective and it, it gives you a little bit of a boost. So that's my favorite part. I love sharing it. And I hope that folks reading that part of the book also feel encouraged and motivated. Perfect. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't easy to um, write your book at all, but I did notice that it said volume one on the cover. So I was just wondering, is there a volume two in the near future or are you planning to write another book on another um, aspect of STEAM in the future? 
That's a good question. So yes, it does say building my self esteem in science volume one. So um, if you actually take a look at the book, um, you can see the letters. So it's esteem. And again, I said, um, steam is spelled S T E A M, which, um, which is the acronym for science, technology, engineering, art and mathematics. And this first book is building my self esteem in science. And so the idea is that the other volumes, the um, consecutive volumes will be building my self-esteem in technology, in engineering, in art, and in mathematics. So there'll be a book, there, there will be a book for just about everyone. Um, and um, hopefully folks will have their favorite characters within the books. Um, the most, um, uh, the, the next project I think that's on the list, the most immediate project would be um, creating a, an activity book, which should accompany the first volume. So this book is for the um, reading age level of about um, five to 13. I think that's really the, the age group that we tend to see um, that it targets. And so I've been asked a lot and my publisher has been asked a lot if we were um, thinking or considering about making something for the younger kids because the book is filled with beautiful um, illustrations and the kids love it. Um, it's just that because the reading level might be a little bit higher that they won't be able to follow along. So we came up with the idea that we would um, try to put together a, an activity book that would accompany this first volume. So it'll be a very similar book um, with very similar images and it will just have a lot more activities so the younger kids could partake um, in um, you know, enjoying the sciences as well. And so after that comes out, then um, hopefully we can roll out the other volumes of the book as well. Cool, and just my last question, where is your book available to buy and what formats is it available in? Yes, yeah, so I see that um, Charmaine was nice enough to place um, some links in the chat box. So the book is available um, to buy on many different platforms. So the first is Amazon. You can purchase the book on Amazon if you look it up um, under Building My Self-Esteem in Science. And again, if you may ensure that you spell STEAM as S-T-E-A-M as opposed to S-T-E-E-M, um, it should pop right up. You can also look it up under my name, Dr. Yasmin Daniels. Um, so it'll show up as well. Um, it's available both on the Kindle version and in paperback. And recently, um, Barnes & Noble um, started selling my book and they, they sell the, hard the hardcover copy. So if you're interested in getting a hardcover copy, which is what I have here, um, you can actually purchase that um, from Barnes and Noble as well. I do also have a limited number of copies, um, signed copies, autographed copies on my website. So I mentioned earlier that the, um, the student who sent me a message referred to me as Classy Chemist. So that's the name that I actually do go by on social media. And so my website is classychemist.com. So if you, um, if anyone is interested in purchasing a signed copy, I do have a limited number of signed copies that I do sell on my website. So you're able to purchase it that way as well. Well, thank you for talking to us about your book. It was really great to hear about that and your experiences as being a black woman in STEAM and just hearing about your college experience in general. And I think thank you. your main will um, basically just take away with the QA, Q and A. Thank you again, Dr. Daniels. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you both. That was so stimulating and so interesting. I can tell you, Dr. Daniels, I read the book. It was so engaging. And there were many points that I saw that even the friendship that Charisma had with you know, just her friends and the support. I think that's important and it shows a real life situation where we do have friends in our circle that are very supportive and keeps pushing us. So thankful for you for um, sharing that knowledge and your experience and talents. We do have some questions that I would like to go to. And we've had one request. Um, there was someone here who wanted to say something out loud um, in, to you personally, so if you don't mind, her name is Julia. And Julia, I'm gonna put you on the mic, so just bear with me one moment and then we'll get to the other questions. Sure. Hello. Well, in the book, I really love the book of my self-esteem. And Dr. Daniels, what is science? means to you in that book? 
thank you for your question, Julia. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for supporting and for purchasing the book. So um, what I believe your question was, what does science mean to me in the book? And so if it, the literal um, response to that is, if you follow the characters within, within the book, um, you notice that there's one character, she's the main character in particular, and she um, she's a student who started out in um, regular classes, um, so regular you know, level classes, and she, um, she started to perform well in school, and so she got promoted to honors classes. And so in her science classes, so science um, could, could be multiple different areas. So it could be chemistry, it could be physical sciences, it could be social sciences. So um, in reading the book, it, you may connect with the character because it reminds you of yourself, but you don't necessarily have to be taking the same particular subjects that she's taking. It's just, it's, it's just, um, it's sort of symbolic. Um, so again, in the literal sense, you know, the sciences that she's taking, they it, specifically it's chemistry. And I chose chemistry because I'm a chemist. So um, I was able to share a little bit of my own story indirectly through the book. And it's not an autobiography, but it does show bits and pieces of the things that I um, went through as a, a chemistry student. So this particular character, she, um, she struggles with chemistry. And so her, um, one of her classmates, one of her friends is actually pretty good in chemistry and she, um, she volunteers to study with her. So, um, you know, as a, as a reader of the book, you know, you may find that you're not into chemistry. Chemistry is not your science or it's not the, the particular science area that, that resonates with you. You might be into other types of science, like, like Ashley, you might be into public policy, um, you know, other areas, health science. Um, and so it really just depends on what resonates with you as the reader. Um, it's not really meant to only, um, you know, specifically pertain to folks who are interested in chemistry. So I hope that answered your question. Thanks so much. So as you know, with Macaulay, um, we work very closely with our guidance counselors throughout the um, throughout the city and beyond. And there are actually two guidance counselors. Well, one is a teacher and a guidance counselor here. So there is an Alan Stack. So for you, Dr. Ja um, Yasmin Daniels. Let's see, it says, um, you did it. Congrats, Yasmin, on a wonderful career already and much more to come from your old Midward chemistry teacher. Um, it just went away from me. Your old Midward chemistry teacher and research advisor, never a doubt here. So high praises. I'm so, when you said the name, I immediately started to get chills and I remember uh, Mr. Stack. So thank you so much. And it's so amazing that you came uh, to support me. And I, I remember your classes. I loved your classes. Um, and thank you for all that you do to encourage, you know, kids um, at Midwood and beyond. So yes, um, it's teachers like you who help, you know, little girls like me um, get the confidence that we need to pursue and to continue to pursue areas of science like chemistry that, you know, lots of other people wouldn't otherwise look at um, as something that, you know, is enjoyable or doable. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that comment. And this one is geared towards you, Ashley. This is a guidance counselor from Townsend Harris, Jeremy Wang. And he said that Ashley was the senior, um, Ashley was a senior year student when I started at Townsend Harris and she was not one of my students, though I remember her. I'm very happy that she is on her way to success. I know she will remember Townsend Harris. That's what matters. So thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Wang. Um, I remember, I remember Mr. Wang. I didn't have him, like he said, but I do have friends who still talk about how much they loved Mr. Wang. So very influential guidance counselor. So let me just move on. Um, give me one second. So there is a question. Has your scientific expertise intersected with the COVID-19 pandemic? That's a good question. Um, so yes, it has actually in a big way. So I mentioned that I'm a policy scientist. Um, 
And so I work in the area um, of safety and health in the workplace. And as you can imagine, COVID-19 has affected every aspect of our lives, personal, professional, workplace, um, everything. So um, we, I, I've actively, I'm actively working on lots of areas where we can increase and improve worker uh, workplace safety and health, um, and um, obviously reducing exposure of um, employees to these types of hazards. So um, I'm an industrial hygienist and basically that's the, essentially the science or the study of um, anticipating, um, controlling um, workplace safety and health hazards. So if you can sort of assess these hazards, anticipate them and figure out ways of controlling them, then you're obviously increasing the workplace safety um, conditions for these workers. And so that's really what my job is. As I mentioned earlier, I started out in the field as a federal investigator. So I would actually go out into the field, take samples, um, go back to the lab, understand whether or not employees were being overexposed. And again, with something like exposure, overexposure, you can't necessarily do that with something like COVID-19 because it's novel. You can actually go out and measure it with a kit. Um, but there are, are the, there are other things that can be done like um, implementing um, engineering controls. So engineering controls is just a, another way of saying, um, you know, um, adding some sort of ventilation system or creating some sort of barrier between people so that way they're not, you know, as close to one another and respiratory drop droplets are not being exchanged from one person to the other, as we know that the virus, um, you know, it transmits. And so there are other things that can be done, like I said, engineering controls, um, work practice. So there's a lot of talk about um, physical distancing. Um, you know, you can wear face covering, um, respirators, so N95s, there's shortages, there's all these things that, um, that are going on. And that really is um, a huge part of what I do every single day at work. So we do spend a lot of time communicating. And as a scientist, I have to communicate the science behind a lot of these things. So explaining to the general public sometimes you know, issues of how an N95 respirator works, um, how the respiratory droplets, um, you know, are not going through them, um, even though the, the size of the particles may be much smaller than the pores of these um, respirator materials. So these are the types of things that we actually um, research and discuss and share. So when I say I really do thoroughly enjoy communicating science, um, it's not just necessarily on the academic level. So teaching um, chemistry at the college um, as an adjunct professor, but I also do it every day um, in my everyday job. Um, and also I do it obviously through um, the children's book that I've written. So hopefully that answers the question on um, whether or not COVID-19 has intersected with my um, professional work. It, it has in a big way. Okay, so we have three more questions. And the next question is from I hope I'm saying your name correctly, so excuse me, Zanaib. And it says, question for Dr. Daniels, what are some classes or extracurriculars you would suggest a current Midwood High School junior to take? I am also interested in pursuing chemistry at a CUNY, at a CUNY with the Macaulay Honors Program. Yay, another perspective, Macaulay. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So when I was at Midwood, I actually, um, I participated and I think it may have been Mr. Stack or one of my other science teachers who encouraged me to participate in the Intel science program. And I'm not sure if that program is still around. Um, I would imagine if it's not, there is something similar, but basically the program allowed um, high school students to do research. So you, you were able to do some sort of independent research in an outside facility. So some students worked at labs in Brooklyn College. I worked at SUNY Downstate. Um, which is a teaching hospital. So they had sort of research there as well. And I was able to go um, to the lab after class, after you know going to high school during the day. I spent like one or two hours after class going to the lab. I worked on really a really cool project with opossums. And that experience was great because I was able to get um, another mentor outside of the school. So your, your teachers obviously are great mentors, but it's also good sometimes to get a different perspective. Um, and she was very um, well versed in, you know, the college application process, writing me a great recommendation, that sort of thing. So my advice is um, maybe, and again, with the COVID-19 pandemic, things are so much diff more different. So you may not be um, able to actually walk into a lab and ask a um, 
uh, a PI, a principal investigator to, to work you know, on a project because their regulations have changed also, but there may be other ways that they found to facilitate this and, you know, to, to allow student participation in these sort of ongoing, um, you know, science uh, research experiments. So that's my piece of advice. If you can get some outside experience, even if it's volunteering um, in, in research, just to see uh, if it's something that you actually like before pursuing it full time in college, um, that would be great because like Ashley mentioned, um, I didn't get to touch on this much earlier, but when I initially started um, at Hunter College in the Macaulay Honors College, I also was pre-med. And I think when you're really good in science, um, you're getting good grades in math and chemistry and physics, sometimes it's what you think um, are your only options. You think, oh, okay, I'm good in science, so I probably should go to medical school. And that's really what my thought process was too. And so my first year, um, as, a, as a freshman in undergrad, I was able to um, do a summer internship again back at SUNY Downstate because it was, um, I had already sort of started to um, create connections there. So that was one nice thing about working there as a high school student. I not only got to work in the lab, but I got to meet some of the other researchers there. So when I was in college, I had that network already. So I, um, as a summer uh, freshman uh, student, I was able to reach back into my network and ask about opportunities to um, or internships that they had available. So I was introduced to a, pro, a summer program, which was sort of a dual program, which allowed me to do um, research in the morning. And I was allowed to, I was able to shadow a, a physician in the afternoon. So all of that was part of the summer package program. And I explained to them what it is I wanted to do. I wanted to use the program to allow me to determine whether or not I wanted to pursue research because I was good at you know, science and I liked doing the, the research side because I had already had an introduction to it in high school, or if I wanted to now pursue medicine because I assumed all my colleagues and my peers were doing that and I probably should be doing it too. And of course, everyone thinks about medicine as being um, sort of like the, mo the most prestigious of all the, of the you know, science careers. Um, so in doing that, I was able to actually um, make the determination at the end of the summer. So I realized a lot of things about myself. I realized that I was a germaphobe um, and I probably would not do well as a physician um, taking care of sick patients. So I think that, I mean, there were a lot of other things that I encountered along the way that I'm not going to get into too much detail about, but I think it was that experience that really allowed me to make that decision. Um, and without having that experience, I probably would have, um, I may have wasted a few more years, you know, pursuing something that I really was, was not, uh, was not suited for. So that's my advice. If you can get some, um, you know, hands-on experience shadowing folks or volunteering in a research center or a lab. Um, and of course, you can reach out to your teachers because they're excellent resources and I'm sure they have a great network. Um, you can just express that interest and I'm sure they will support you in doing so. Great, thank you. So there are two more questions and I see that Elda, um, she said that both of you are wonderful panelists. And with the struggle of imposter syndrome and other adversity, how did you overcome those feelings and manage to find out what you're passionate about and what you want to pursue? Ashley, do you want to take this question? I think we kind of touched on it a little bit at the beginning, um, but um, so I can kind of just um, repeat repeat a few of what I've uh, the, the items that I've touched on, but. For me specifically, it was putting on my blinders and I don't think imposter syndrome is something that just goes away overnight. Um, as we continue to progress in our careers and we get to different levels of our careers, we may still continue to feel like we um, are not worthy of the, uh, um, you know, the achievements that we're gaining. So um, again, if you have an ultimate goal and you haven't met that goal yet, or maybe you need to reassess and create a new goal once you've met that goal, um, it, it really does help with um, sort of alleviate, alleviating those feelings of imposter syndrome. But you can, um, you can add to that, Ashley, if you, if you need to. Yeah, I'm basically echoing what Dr. Daniel said and also just to add, um, just giving myself credit when it's due, like when I do something, just like, you know, recognizing my accomplishments, not downplaying them. Um, and also just like, sorry, just escaped my mind, but um, basically just not comparing myself to other people, making sure that, um, you know, everyone's on their own time. And when it makes sense, if you compare yourself to everyone, you're never gonna be happy. So just making sure that, you know, you're um, 
taking your time with your things, you're recognizing that, you know, your process may be slower or faster than others, but it's no less valuable than other people, so. Thank you. So there is, there's two more questions, but I know I said one more. So I don't think we are ready, Elda. I believe you already asked a question. So this is going to Grace. Um, so Grace Chen, she's in the ninth grade, also same high school as you, Dr. Daniels, Midwood High School. And she has a quick question. Do you guys mind inviting me so I can ask the question? So bear me one moment, Grace, and I'll let you ask your question. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, both of you guys are amazing panelists. And I just wanna say like, it's so cool to see women of color in STEM and doing so much. Um, my question was for Dr. Daniels. Um, so I'm a ninth grader, but it's definitely one of my biggest dreams in this life to publish a book. So do you have any advice for you know young students who are looking to do this in the future and how to overcome this fear of maybe it not being perfect enough or fear of being judged or fear of taking on too much yeah so thank you for your question grace um and i think these are very true and real feelings to have um and i commend you for being in the ninth grade and already aspiring to be an author because i don't think in the ninth grade those were even um thoughts that i was having i was interested in lots of other things but not writing books um but my advice for you um is I think you're thinking along the right path already. Um, you, you already know what it is that you want to do. So I think you should probably start um, outlining the steps that will help you to get there. So, um, you know, one of the things you have to think about is, you know, whether or not you want to be self-published or you want to work with a publisher. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of authors take into consideration and both of those avenues um, might be very different from, um, you know, and in terms of what you're looking for. So you have to really try to understand what it is that you want. And I think the major difference for me was um, with uh, self-publishing, there's a lot of groundwork and footwork that you have to do, um, but it also allows you to more creativity and flexibility or more versatility on your work. And with a publisher, sometimes they have a little bit more rigidity. Um, they have a particular style that they like to publish their books with, um, but they also have more, sometimes more resources. So they may be able to um, help you distribute your book to a wider, wider audience. So these are two things that you can start to think about initially. And beyond that, um, if you already have an idea, maybe you have a manuscript, I'm not sure how far you've gotten into your book, um, start thinking about your target audience, start thinking about the reading level. So who are you trying to reach with your, your, um, your piece of work and making sure that you're actually hit, um, you know, hitting those marks with your book, because that's going to determine how far your book goes and the, the route that you'll take in sort of, um, you know, advertising or distributing your books. So some things that you should start thinking about, um, the style that you wanna write your book. Do you want it to be a picture book? Do you want it to be a chapter book? Um, the length of your book. Um, so these are all kinds of things that go into writing um, and it's not a process. Don't, don't try to convince yourself that it's a process that happens quickly. Um, I know, you know, folks who've written books that has taken years and years to perfect it. Um, there are also maybe several um, iterations of your books, a lot of revisions that will um, take place. Um, I highly recommend you go, um, go with a, a professional editor because um, even after reading your draft and your manuscript over and over, you will inevitably come across uh, an error. I actually, and I will disclose this, I had to have a reprint after my book was initially re released um, because I found errors. And again, I wrote the book, so I thought I knew and I saw everything. We had an editor. I thought the editor caught lots of things that I actually didn't even notice or, or see. And so when I got the edits back, I was shocked by all of the, um, the things that the editor had flagged. I was like, oh my goodness, how could I have not seen it? But it's because our eyes are so trained to sort of gloss over these words that we don't pick it up. Um, and as a, as a writer, you want to be able to put forth the, the best piece of writing that you can put together because that's kind of the, a representation of you. So that's another piece of advice. So, you know, as good of a writer as you probably think you are, you still need a little bit of professional editing um, to help your work, you know, become a little bit more polished. So hopefully these pieces of advice help um, you along your journey with becoming a publisher, uh, becoming an author, sorry. 
So that looks like we are wrapped up. We're past a little bit over our time, but I wanna thank everyone for joining us. It was such a great conversation. We actually will have this on our website. We are recording at the moment and um, you can always visit us at macaulay.cuny.edu slash events. Um, I also typed in that we will have a draw for someone. Um, we're putting all the attendees into a, um, raffle and someone will win Dr. Daniel's book, Building My Self-Esteem. So thank you again um, from Macaulay. On behalf of Macaulay, thank you, Dr. Daniels. Thank you, Ashley. And we'll be looking for more things from you in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.